This is chapter 15, Microbial Mechanisms of Pathogenicity. So in this chapter, we'll look at some specific properties of microbes that contribute to their ability to cause disease. So microbes aren't trying to hurt us or make us sick, right? They're just living their life and getting food and defending themselves. So sometimes just the mere presence of microbes can be enough to induce symptoms in the host. Most microbial properties that contribute to their pathogenicity aren't really well known, um, but what we do know is that if the microbe is able to overpower the host's defenses, then disease results. When we talk about pathogenicity, we're just talking about the ability of a microorganism to cause disease. So is it pathogenic or non-pathogenic? Virulence is the degree of pathogenicity. So some microbes are more virulent or more pathogenic than others. So most microbes have a preferred portal of entry or way that they're able to gain entrance inside of the host. Mucous membranes are one of the most common portals of entry. So remember all of our open body cavities are lined with these mucous membranes. So the easiest way to get into the body is pretty much right through the front door. Right? So the respiratory tract is usually the easiest. So just by simple inhalation to the respiratory system, um, and then it has access to the rest of the body. The digestive system is another portal of entry, although most microbes will be killed by the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, but there are some that can make it through and cause infection. The genitourinary tract, so for urinary tract infections or sexually transmitted infections, as well as the conjunctiva or the membrane of the eye. So the conjunctival membrane of the eye is also connected to the respiratory system. So our tear, um, our tear ducts drain out into the nasal cavity. So something could potentially land on your eye right, and get into your respiratory system through that portal of entry. The skin is a pretty good impenetrable barrier as long as it's unbroken. Remember, the keratin in the skin cells helps make them more durable um, and waterproof, and also some skin secretions right, help to prevent uh, microbial attachment to the skin surfaces. However, some microbes can still enter through open hair follicles um, or sweat gland ducts. Some fungal cells um, can also just grow on keratin in the skin itself, so things like ringworm. When we talk about the parenteral root, um, this is when the microbe or the infection has been deposited directly into the tissues when our, those barriers have been penetrated or injured. So things like punctures, um, injections, bites, cuts, surgery, anything that damages the skin barrier where now those microbes can gain entry. So even after microbes have entered the body, they don't necessarily cause disease. The pathogenicity of a microbe is going to depend on several factors, one of which is which portal of entry is used. So we said most pathogens have a preferred portal of entry where they're able to cause um, the most damage. So their preferred portal of entry required for them to be able to cause disease. So one example would be streptococci um, that are inhaled can cause pneumonia. But if you were to swallow them, right, you're not going to get pneumonia. So they're just going to be killed by the acid in the stomach. So they have to enter through the respiratory system. However, some pathogens can cause disease from multiple portals of entry. So for example, anthrax. So you can become infected with anthrax through ingestion or inhalation, um, as well as cutaneous infection or contact infection. And generally, if only a few microbes enter the body, they'll probably be overcome by our host defenses. However, if a large number gains entry in a relatively short period of time, they're going to be more likely to overpower our host defenses. So with the COVID-19 pandemic, one concern was for healthcare professionals right, that are getting higher viral loads or levels of exposure to the virus right, that's going to just overpower their defenses. Whereas with a normal infection, you may only be exposed to a small amount of viral particles um, that you're able to kind of build a defense against right, before they can increase their numbers. Whatever, if you're just constantly bombarded with those viral particles, 
and you would just get overwhelmed. Um, your immune system would get overwhelmed trying to overcome those. When we look at the ID50 or the infectious dose for 50% of a population. So this helps us to measure the virulence of the microbe. Right? But again, this can vary based on the portal of entry. So in the previous example, we said anthrax right, has multiple portals of entry. But the ID50, right, or the virulence of the anthrax microbe, is going to vary based on this portal of entry, how it entered the body. So if the portal of entry is the skin, it only takes a relatively small number of those endospores or infectious cells to cause infection in at least 50%. Whereas via ingestion, right, you're going to have to ingest a large, much larger amount of endospores right, to become infected. The LD50 is the lethal dose for 50% of a population. So this is more so measuring the potency of a toxin. So different toxins um, have different potencies. So botulinum toxin requires 0.03 nanograms right, to be lethal for 50%, whereas um, a staphylococcal enterotoxin it requires much higher amount. So first off, in order to infect a host cell, the uh, pathogen has to be able to adhere right, or stick to the host cell to gain entry. So this is called adherence. So almost all pathogens have to attach to our host tissues in this process um, called adherence or adhesion. So think like an adhesive, um, like tape right, or glue, it's just going to help the microbe stick to the host cell right, to cause this infection. Adherence is done by proteins called adhesins or ligands on the pathogen that bind to receptors on the host cells. So these adhesins um, could be found on external structures like the glycocalyx um, or other surface structures like the fimbriae or pillock. So this is showing some of these adhesin proteins on the outer surface of our pathogen cell that are able to bind right, or adhere and stick to receptors on the surface of our host cell. Right, so now this pathogen can gain entry um, and cause infection of our host cells. Along with adherence, some microbes may form biofilms. Right, so basically these large aggregate communities of microbes that can share nutrients and increase the degree of adhesion right, and ultimately become resistant or more um, resistant to phagocytosis. So this is showing some adherence of E. coli bacteria with pili on the urinary tract in a urinary tract infection. Right, so they're able to stick to um, those urinary tract cells and adhere so they're not as easily washed out with the urine. Some pathogens can damage the surface of the host cell, but most are going to have to penetrate the actual tissues to cause disease. So looking at how some bacterial pathogens can penetrate or um, evade through our host defenses, one mechanism is production of capsules. So we talked about capsules before. They're these kind of thick, hardened uh, glycocalyx. Um, cases, sugar cases around the cell wall. So these are to help inhibit phagocytosis. It makes these cells more resistant to be being eaten. Right? So our macrophages, our immune system cells aren't able to kind of bite through this hard shell, this hard capsule. So some common types of pathogens that produce these capsules are strep pneumonia, so pneumonia, uh, anthrax, plague, and meningitis causing bacteria. So remember from lab, we did the capsule stain. So the capsules appear as these clear little halos around our stained cells. Certain cell wall components may also help our bacterial pathogens penetrate through our host defenses. So one example would be the M protein. So these are kind of spike proteins um, on the surface of some uh, cells that are going to help mediate attachment to the host cell while resisting phagocytosis. Um, so similar to the capsule, it just makes it harder for our macrophages and immune cells to kind of bite down and eat um, these pathogens. 
Some cell walls may be composed of this waxy lipid called mycolic acid. So our acid fast bacteria that we saw in lab, right, the mycobacterium. Um, so this waxy lipid um, cell wall is just going to help resist digestion by uh, immune cells. Right? So as we saw in lab, acid fast bacteria, mycobacteria have their own special type of stain um, that's able to penetrate through that thick waxy mycolic acid. Some bacteria can produce enzymes to help them penetrate through the host defenses. So one example are coagulases and kinases. So remember, ACE tells us it's an enzyme, and enzymes are usually named for what they do. So a coagulase is going to cause coagulation right, or clotting of the fibrinogen proteins and to form uh, these protective uh, clots. So we kind of wall off, the bacteria will wall off itself um, to protect it against our immune system. Kinases can then digest and break down these clots and release the bacteria into the bloodstream. Hyaluronidase and collagenase are enzymes that work to digest and break down the tissues right, to help bacteria penetrate through the tissue layer. So we're going to break down the polysaccharides that hold the cells together in those epithelial sheets, right, those tissue sheets. And then collagenase enzymes break down the collagen um, holding the connective tissue under the skin. So now the bacteria have made an opening and they're able to now invade those deeper tissues. IgA proteases are enzymes that destroy IgA protein antibodies. So IgA antibodies are naturally produced in our body secretions to help prevent adhesion to the mucosa. Right? So it's in our saliva and our mucus. Um, so some bacteria can produce enzymes that specifically target and break down these antibodies. Right? So remember, everything goes back to structure, reflects function. So if we destroy the structure of these antibodies, they'll no longer be able to protect against infection. Many pathogens can use antigenic variation to alter their surface antigens to help them penetrate or evade our normal host defenses. So antibodies are specific, I mean specifically shaped to recognize and bind to specific shaped antigens, right, or proteins on the surface of these pathogens. So a lot of pathogens, viruses, and uh, bacteria are able to mutate and change the shape of their surface proteins and antigens. So now our antibodies are basically rendered ineffective. So this is one reason why we have to get a new flu shot every year. So it mutates. So the antibodies that you um, developed last year from last year's flu shot right, will no longer recognize the new shape of this year's flu strain. Some pathogens can actually penetrate into the host cell cytoskeleton. So they produce uh, these surface proteins called invasins that allow them to invade into the host cell by disrupting the cytoskeleton. And it causes what's called membrane ruffling. So it kind of ruffles um, and fluffs out the membrane. So the cytoskeleton kind of stitching and holding the membrane and the cell together forming these little openings and pockets where now the bacteria can enter the cell. Some pathogens are able to actually survive inside our phagocytes. So they get into the cell and our immune cells, our phagocytes are able to capture them. Right? Well, normally we would um, fuse our captured pathogen with a lysosome containing digestive enzymes, right? break it down, and then exocytosis um, the waste products. But some pathogens are able to alter the pH inside the phagolysosome, rendering um, those enzymes ineffective, allowing it to survive. Um, some are able to escape from the phagosome before it fuses with the lysosome, so it's never exposed to those lysozyme uh, enzymes. Some pathogens can prevent fusion of the lysosome, um, so again, it's never in contact with those digestive enzymes. So just because a pathogen has been captured by a phagocyte doesn't necessarily mean uh, that that's the end of that particular pathogen. So once pathogens have entered into the host cell um, and evaded our defenses, uh, so to, in order to cause infection, they then have to go on to cause damage or harm to those host cells.
So one way that bacterial pathogens can damage the host cells is by using the host nutrients. So if the pathogen uses up all of your nutrients, they're not available for your cells. So your metabolism and your cells aren't able to function properly. So one way that bacteria can kind of steal our nutrients and resources is with siderophores. So iron is important for most pathogenic bacteria to reproduce. So they produce siderophore proteins um, that are just going to bind iron more tightly than our host cells, right? So the bacteria are able to get all of the iron for themselves right before the host cells have a chance to. Pathogens can also cause direct damage to the host cell by disrupting normal host cell function, uh, using the host cell nutrients, producing harmful waste products. Well, some pathogens can also reproduce inside the host cells and cause them to rupture. However, most host cell damage is going to be caused by toxins. The toxins are poisonous substances that are produced by microorganisms. So these toxins are usually the primary factor of an organism's pathogenic properties. So toxins may produce uh, symptoms like fever or cardiovascular problems, digestive problems like diarrhea, um, they can physically destroy cells and cause the body to go into shock. Toxigenicity is just the ability of a microbe to produce a toxin. Toxemia is presence of toxin in the host's blood. Right? So emia meaning blood, toxins in the blood. And intoxication is the presence of a toxin, but without the microbial growth. So the toxin is there, but the actual uh, microbe that produced that toxin is no longer there. So this is showing two examples of two well-known toxins, botulinum toxin and tetanus toxin. So botulinum toxin um, causes a paralysis. So it's going to stop muscle contraction. Right? So normal mechanism, we have uh, the acetylcholine right, binding to the muscle cell, triggering that muscle contraction. Uh, so botulinum toxin just blocks the release of that neurotransmitter. So the muscle never gets the signal to contract right? and is essentially paralyzed. Right? So a potential bonus question on your next exam, uh, botulinum toxin is used in Botox. Pretty common, well-known cosmetic treatment for wrinkles. Right? You get some Botox injections. Uh, so what they're actually injecting into your face is botulinum toxin. So bonus question, what toxin is commonly used in cosmetic procedures? Botox or botulinum toxin. Tetanus toxin is the opposite. So instead of causing paralysis of the muscle, we're causing um, uncontrollable or excessive muscle contraction or a tetanus. So in normal mechanism, we have some inhibitory um, neurotransmitters to stop the muscle contraction. So with tetanus toxin, it's blocking those inhibitory um, neurotransmitters. So we just get a constant um, influx of those stimulatory acetylcholine. So the muscle cell keeps getting signals to contract and contract and contract, and it never gets to relax. Exotoxins are proteins produced and secreted by bacteria. Um, so these are mostly gram-positive bacteria that are producing these exotoxins. So exotoxins are generally soluble in body fluids, and they can destroy host cells or inhibit metabolic functions. So like an exotoxin, it's being secreted outside the cell, right? generally your gram-positive bacteria. Antitoxins are antibodies against specific exotoxins. So our immune system produces antibodies against certain antigens or surface proteins on cells to help protect us. Um, they can also produce antibodies against specific toxins, right? So these are just called antitoxins. So, but they work essentially the same way as antibodies. They'll bind to the toxin um, and essentially render it ineffective, right? So it's not able to go and contact any other cells. Toxoids are inactivated exotoxins that are used in vaccines, like the tetanus vaccine. AB toxins contain an enzyme component or an active component and a binding or B component. 
So the AB exotoxin is released from your gram-positive cell. The B component, binding component, binds to a host cell receptor. It, it gains entry into the host cell. So now the A and B components will separate and the active enzyme component can now carry out its function. Generally, um, some way of inhibiting protein synthesis of the host cell. Membrane disrupting toxins lyse the host cell by disrupting the plasma membrane or forming pores in the membrane. So this is common in gas gangrene infections. So leukocetins um, are these toxins that are going to kill phagocytic leukocytes, right? so some white blood cells. Um, hemolysins are going to lyse or kill erythrocytes or red blood cells by forming these channel proteins. So essentially, um, either too much can flow in and cause the cell to swell and burst, or too much can flow out and cause the cell to shrink uh, and die. Streptolysins are just specific type of hemolysins or blood lysing toxins uh, produced by streptococci. So we'll see in lab when we look at hemolysis on our blood auger plate, right? So we had the three different categories of hemolysis or the degree to which uh, these bacteria are able to lyse and break down the blood cells. So different species can contain different classes of hemolysin toxins. Right? So each hemolysin or type of hemolysin uh, enzyme is going to produce a different pattern. Right? So we have our beta, alpha, and gamma hemolysis. Um, so another potential bonus question for your next exam. Uh, blood auger contains 5% sheep blood. So what type of blood is used in blood auger? Right? Sheep blood. Super antigens can cause an intense immune response due to your release of cytokines from the host cells or the T cells, the immune system cells. Um, so this can lead to what's called a cytokine storm um, and have symptoms of fever, nausea, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, shock, and even death. So essentially what happens is the super antigen causes kind of an overreaction of the immune system. Right. So it's detecting that antigen in various locations of the body um, and has a massive release of these cytokines and causes these cytokine storms. So this is one cause of concern in COVID-19 infections is kind of the overzealous response of the immune system against this infection right, to lead to these cytokine storms. Genotoxins are going to damage the genes or DNA and cause mutations that can disrupt cell division or lead to cancer. Remember, all cell structure and function is based on the genetic code, right? those instructions. So if we change or mutate those instructions, right, we could have abnormal um, cell function or uh, uncontrolled abnormal cell growth or cancer. Endotoxins um, are produced within bacterial cells and make up part of that outer cell wall in our gram-negative bacteria. Right? So remember we talked about the lipopolysaccharide layer um, in gram-negative bacteria, so they have that extra layer of uh, cell wall. So the lipid A in the lipopolysaccharide portion is that endotoxin. So endotoxins are generally released either during replication or cell death. Right? So it's possible to have some endotoxins present even after you kill the cells. So the endotoxins are more heat stable um, than the cells themselves. So once the cell dies, the cell wall breaks down, these endotoxins are now going to be released. So these endotoxins can cause the macrophages to release cytokines um, and lead to those cytokine storms and cause septic shock. Uh, it can also cause disseminated intravascular coagulation or um, just capillary blood clots, which lead to tissue death. Right? So the tissues aren't able to get oxygen because of all the blood clotting, damage to uh, blood vessel epithelia, um, and can lead to these tissue deaths. Endotoxins can also stimulate the pyrogenic response or the fever response. So genic means genesis or formation of, pyro means fire, right? So pyrogenic response is just raising body temperature um, in a fever. 
So macrophage ingests a gram-negative bacteria, kills it. As the cell dies and breaks apart, it's going to release those endotoxins that are going to cause the macrophage and the immune system cells to release cytokines. So the cytokines travel through the blood um, where they are detected by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is like your body's thermostat. So the detection of these cytokines, these immune system alarm chemicals tell the brain there's an infection, right? So we need to crank up the thermostat right, and produce that fever. So fever response can help the body to recover more quickly. It can increase metabolism. It can also inhibit some bacterial growth, kind of slow them down if maybe we can sweat them out. So summary, exo versus endotoxins. So your exotoxins are mostly from gram positive. Endotoxins are only from gram negative because they're part of that lipopolysaccharide. Like exotoxins are usually protein based, right? So like the AB toxins. Endotoxins are uh, lipid based. So they're the lipid A of that lipopolysaccharide. Endotoxins are also more heat stable. So they can withstand autoclaving. Uh, whereas exotoxins are more easily destroyed. And some examples of exotoxin diseases um, include gas gangrene, tetanus, botulism, right? so the Botox, diphtheria, and scarlet fever. Some examples of endotoxin diseases, things like typhoid fever, urinary tract infections, and meningitis. The limulus amoebocyte lysate assay, or the LAL assay, um, is used to test for endotoxins. So this test used the blood of horseshoe crabs that contain special cells called amoebocytes. And these amoebocytes will lyse um, or die and clump and clot in the presence of the endotoxin right, and produce that clumping or those clots. So similar to like with blood typing, right? So if it has a reaction, the endotoxin is there, the cells will start to clot up um, and we'll get that positive test result. So horseshoe crab blood is blue because it contains a pigment, a blue pigment called hemocyanin. So our blood pigment is hemoglobin, right? Heme um, is the red pigment. They just have uh, a different color pigment in their blood to carry their oxygen. Um, but another potential fun fact, bonus question for your next test. Um, this horseshoe crab blood runs for about $60,000 a gallon. So if you ever need a backup job plan, you can always go into uh, bleeding out horseshoe crabs right, for this limulus amoebocyte lysate um, solution. Right, so bonus question, how much does a gallon of horseshoe crab blood cost $60,000. So we've talked in earlier chapters about uh, plasmids, lysogeny, um, and how that can contribute to pathogenicity. So remember the plasmids carry um, the bonus gene. So they're not part of the main chromosome. They're kind of an extra chromosome that may carry genes for things like toxin production, um, antibiotics, antibiotic resistance, uh, and certain enzymes. So through the process of lysogeny, um, we had that lysogenic conversion. We can um, incorporate right, another microbe's DNA, a phage DNA, right, into the host cell and have that prophage. So now this prophage, this recombined kind of hybrid cell, can produce some of those new traits. So the cell may now start to produce a capsule or um, some toxins. So we can change the characteristics of the microbe due to an incorporation of this prophage, right, or this uh, recombined chromosome. So the viral mechanism for evading host defenses is, is a bit different than bacteria because they essentially hide and grow inside the host cell. Right? So this is one reason why antibiotics are not effective against viral infections right, because right, they hijack your host cell metabolic machinery. So they're kind of hiding in your own cells. So viruses are sneaky in that their attachment sites can mimic some of our regular neurotransmitters and substances like uh, acetylcholine. Right? So we can kind of trick our cells into attaching to the viruses and letting them in. 
The one way that HIV virus avoids immune detection is by attacking and killing the immune cells directly. Right? So if there's no immune system to fight off the infection, then it can just spread freely. But one mechanism for um, defense against these viral infections is production of interferons. So interferons basically interfere with viral replication. So interferons are produced by virally infected cells. So one cell um, gets infected by the virus, but kind of in its last dying breath, it's going to release these interferon signals to neighboring cells to help protect them from infection, to hopefully prevent the spread of this virus. So interferons can uh, signal neighboring uninfected cells to destroy RNA and reduce protein synthesis. So essentially lock your doors right before the virus gets there. Um, it can signal to neighboring infected cells to undergo apoptosis or basically cell suicide before the virus has a chance to replicate more and spread more. Just go ahead and kill these infected cells early. Um, and interferons can also activate other immune cells to help counteract this infection. Many viruses display what are called cytopathic effects. Um, so these are just physically visible effects of a viral infection on a cell. So viruses can affect cells by stopping cell synthesis. Um, they can cause lysosomes to release enzymes, those digestive enzymes, and they kind of just digest themselves. Um, they can create inclusion bodies in the cell cytoplasm. Um, so this picture is showing some infected cells that have dark inclusions within the nuclei that are representing um, the sites of viral assembly. So these cells are infected with viruses, and you can see these darker granules or inclusions where the viruses are being um, assembled and multiplying. Some viruses can cause cells to fuse together and create a syncytium. So a syncytium is kind of just a single coordinated unit. Um, so we have a bunch of cells kind of fused together and coordinated or moving and functioning in kind of a coordinated unit. Viruses can also change host cell function, including chromosomal changes, so they can cause mutations and lead to cancers or abnormal cell growth. They can also induce antigenic changes on the cell surface and a loss of contact inhibition, which can lead to cancer. So contact inhibition is just a cell overgrowth. So normally cells can detect um, kind of where other cells are so they don't overgrow too much. Um, so with this loss of contact inhibition, the cells just kind of overgrow on top of each other, kind of in an uncontrolled manner. So there are other microbes that can be pathogenic and cause disease and infection uh, besides bacteria and viruses. Um, so we'll look at some pathogenic properties of fungi, protozoa, helmets, and algae. So fungi mainly produce um, infection or disease by their toxic metabolic products. Um, and may inhibit protein synthesis and normal cell function. Um, a lot of them can induce an allergic reaction or modify the host cell membranes. Some fungi can have capsules to prevent phagocytosis, just how some bacteria can have capsules to prevent phagocytosis. Protozoa infections um, can be caused by either the presence of the protozoan and or their waste products right, that can cause symptoms. Um, so malaria is caused by a plasmodium, right, protozoan infection. A lot of protists can avoid uh, host defenses by either digesting the cells and tissue fluids. Uh, they can grow within the phagocytes, and they can also display antigenic variation, right, so our immune system is not able to recognize them. Helmets are the parasitic worms that must use host tissues for growth. So most common, well-known example is um, elephantiasis. So it's a helmet infection that uh, blocks the lymphatic circulation. So it kind of takes up residence in uh, the lymphatic system and the lymph vessels and blocks that fluid circulation. So it builds up um, into these large uh, masses. Right. So helmets can cause extensive cellular damage. Uh, they also can produce waste products that can cause symptoms as well. Algae can produce um, a neurotoxin called saxitoxin um, during red tide. Right? So they say don't eat fish or shellfish from red tide uh, because it can cause 
paralytic shellfish poisoning. Right, so these algae um, hatch in the ocean um, and then they're going to be filtered out by the shellfish. Right, so the sh uh, shellfish are going to kind of secondarily carry this toxin uh, when eaten by humans. So portals of exit are generally the same as portals of entry. So infections are going to be spread or leave the body, right? generally the same way organ system that they came in. So respiratory tract illnesses right, you get through inhalation um, and then they're spread and exit the body through coughing and sneezing, right? also through the respiratory tract. Uh, GI infections are spread through feces and saliva. Uh, genitourinary tract can be passed through urine or secretions from the genitals, right, things like uh, STIs. Skin infections can be spread through contact, right, so things like herpes, uh, ringworm, HPV warts, uh, wound drainage right, can all be portals of exit to spread those skin infections. Um, and bloodborne infections can be spread through arthropods or you know, insects that bite, uh, shared needles or syringes, right, or just contact with the blood. So key concepts take away from this chapter. There are several factors required for a microbe to cause disease. So after the microbe gains entry and enters the host, uh, most pathogens have to adhere to the host tissue and evade the host defenses. So pathogens are usually going to leave the body via the same portal of exit um, where they entered initially.